Hey everyone and welcome to another Tech Talk with Tomar. This time we are in sunny Miami in person for the first time with a stellar family. I'm very excited to be speaking with Tori Samples from Leaf Global. Um, Tori, how's it going? Going great. This has been the best two days that I've had in a while. That's awesome. So Tori, we've known each other for a while and you lead quite the uh, exceptional team of developers in Leaf Global. Yeah. And I'd love to learn a bit more about how you ended up in Leaf Global and maybe about your personal story. I know you have quite the story. <laughs> well, I don't know about that, but um, it is unique, definitely. And I like telling it because it helps me advocate for getting other people who might be unlikely tech people, unlikely entrepreneurs into the space. So short version is I studied music in college and then happened into working in a healthcare IT shop and loved it. They taught me how to code. They taught me how to do everything that I needed to do. And that built a strong sense of loyalty in me to the company for teaching me how to do that. So I'm a big advocate for bringing in people who do have transferable skills in some way um, into the tech industry and then growing them up in-house. I, I did that for a number of years and honestly was tired of being a woman in tech and so decided to go back to business school stay in healthcare, get out of IT. And then of course I stayed in technology and got up out of healthcare. But, um, but the chance to do LEAF was really unique. It combined a lot of personal passions and professional background and skills. It was a chance to actually start a business out of business school, which you hear about, but I never expected for myself. So yeah, fast forward four years and we built and deployed a product in East Africa that helps people move money across borders, mostly unbanked people, refugees, migrants, et cetera. And we sold it a couple months ago, which is amazing. Congratulations. And I'm definitely going to have some questions about that. But it's this is awesome. I, ha I actually didn't know you came from, from music. Um, yeah. And I really do think that some of the most um, creative people in tech that, uh, that I know came from the world of the arts. Uh, uh, MIT is huge on music. A lot of uh, a lot of music programs there. So uh, awesome. And so, how did you end up in Africa? <laughs> uh, also a long story, but I've been around African people for as long as I can remember, literally since I was three years old. So my family, I uh, was really close with immigrant and refugee communities in the US and I started getting heavily involved in that. I think I went to Kenya the first time when I was 17 and lived in Tanzania a couple times with my husband short term and then moved over to Rwanda as part of LEAF. So originally started it in the US, ran it remotely for about a year and decided that as much as I felt like I knew the context, there was no substitute for being on the ground, seeing it work out day to day, especially as we were getting closer to deploying a product. That's also where our staff is. And so if for that time, I wanted to invest myself heavily in it and then get it to a point where it could be sustainable without being there literally every day. Yeah, and I think that's a good lesson for developers out there who are building financial instruments you cannot understand sitting in San Francisco what it's like to actually transact on the ground in Africa, in Southeast Asia, in Latin America. It's very different and you really need that experience to, to understand that. That's awesome. So, um, you know, how did you get into Stellar or how did or when did you first learn about Stellar? So I was not on board with doing a blockchain based product of any kind at the beginning. Uh, it was all my co-founder, Nat, who came and said, well, why don't we do blockchain? And I, I'm not a bandwagon person. I've gone through a few different hype cycles of you know the next new big technology and, and seeing how that works out when people just rush to a specific technology without understanding the specifics of it and why it needs to be there. So my initial answer was no to all blockchains. And then as I started researching, I found that this actually could be a really good use case, but not for the umbrella term of blockchain. And so we we did originally look at Ethereum and um, had somebody build a bit of a prototype for that. And it just wasn't the right technical fit. It was too slow. It was too expensive. And... <laughs> at the moment when someone is leaving their country with all of the cash that they have put into your digital product, that is not the time to introduce a new currency or tell them to wait 10 minutes to an hour to know if their transaction has gone through. 
So we actually, um, we, we started this in grad school. We had a team of students that was helping us with market research. And one, one, of, the, um, one of the guys who was helping us out was presenting at this conference in Mexico. And afterwards, a Californian guy came up to him and was like, hey, have you heard of Stellar? I think it'd be a really good fit for what you're doing. So totally random, but very thankful. That's great. And so as someone, obviously technical, you're the CTO of the company, um, what can you, what advice can you give people building on Stellar or building on blockchain in general? I think it, at the beginning of the decision-making process, before you start getting into the specific chains and what they do well, just really narrowing in on what you need because our use case is, is very different than most of what's been built out there. I mean, that's, that is why we were the first to deploy blockchain-based services for people without smartphones, uh, because it's not the, the typical use case. So I would really recommend dialing in on the product features that you need after you've defined the problem and the underlying currents below that, figure out what you need in a technical product and then go find the right fit for that. That would be the first thing. Stellar specifically, um, I think the documentation is really good and it's definitely gotten better over time. So I think it's a lot easier for somebody to come into the ecosystem now than it was three, four years ago when we were starting to do it and had no clue what we were doing. But also I think SDF is very approachable and, and has made it easy to find resources. Um, so that's, that's a great thing that is not true in bigger communities, I'd say. You know, you might almost get inundated, flooded with resources and don't know where to start. Whereas with Stellar, documentation is clear. There are key people who can help along the way. You can figure it out. Awesome. And I think, you know, part of what you're saying is, you know, make sure the technology fits your requirements, which sounds obvious when you come from tech, but actually in the world of blockchain, sometimes kind of like gets missed. Well, it's been skewed. There's been so much hype around it and, and so much money thrown at it that People often don't start with the foundational building blocks because they've heard enough about everything that they feel like they, they know what's out there and, and it changes so fast that you really do have to go examine that and then re-examine it and do that iterative uh, decision making so that you make sure that you're still on the right track. And, and what's the secret sauce that makes, uh, that makes Leaf so successful? I think it's our dedication to the non-smartphone side of things. That was the initial use case. We've expanded a lot since then. But if you look at our transactions, the majority of them still come from non-smartphones. So the little basic you know, Nokias that you had back in the day, I'm sure, that we all had. Um, even when people have a smartphone, they prefer using our non-smartphone application because it's fast, it's easy for them to understand, it doesn't require data or extended battery life. And because we've made it accessible in their environment, it works for them. And tell us a bit about that tech stack, because obviously, you know, feature phones are not common in the world of blockchain. Uh, so I imagine there's like an interesting tech stack behind the scene there. Yeah, I think it's it's not as complicated as people expect. Uh, it's, it's always like, I don't want to be a letdown to anybody, but it, we have pretty simple tooling. So uh, our USSD application, which is the non-smartphone side of things, is written in JavaScript and it hits the same backend that our smartphone app hits. So that was a really important thing for me was that no matter how someone accesses, it has to be the same engine behind things that is powering it because people move devices, they, they lose their phone all the time or you know it breaks and you're not able to get another one for a while. And so that was a really key piece for me was we need to make the front end agnostic and then the back end is really where everything happens. That's also just my bias, I'm more of a back end person. That's awesome. And tell us a bit about, uh, you know, you've been acquired mm -hmm. uh, by IDT. Tell us a bit about the acquisition process and, uh, you know, what the future holds for you guys. Yeah. So background, IDT is a publicly traded company in the U.S. and been around for about 30 years doing telecommunications, fintech, uh, money transfer. So you, they have a product in the U.S. where you can send money out to 180 countries around the world. Great. Um, they were interested in us because of the digital wallet side of things. So the more the intra Africa looking at outbound flows from anywhere in the world. And they initially approached us as a potential partner. So what started as a partnership discussion quickly became fundraising. And well, maybe we could participate in a round, maybe we could lead a round. Actually, it makes more sense strategically to just do a full acquisition. And 
for us, I think, well, for me, I'll say personally, I, I think it's a really good long-term fit. It's a good home for the organization. Despite all of the things that we've done and the things that I'm really proud of, I, I see a huge gap in us getting to our long-term goals without the backing of that larger organization to get us through the short and the medium term. So I think that it was an earlier acquisition than we might have expected, but the right thing for the company. That's great. And we've known IDT for a while. Mm -hmm. uh, they're really great. Uh, would it be safe to assume that uh, the Stellar community was how you actually got introduced? Actually, no. Okay. I, uh, I went back and looked at pictures from 2019 Meridian, uh, I don't know, six months ago for something else. And I, I had taken a picture of the slide with all of the logos up there. And at the time, I was really proud because we were brand new and our logo made the slide. And then surprise of surprises, I looked and right next to it is the IDT logo. And yeah, I was very surprised that they had been involved in the Stellar ecosystem all the way back to 2019. Um, but it's been encouraging to see that we've got actually three different parts of the organization that have different projects going on on Stellar. And so we're really excited about the potential of bringing those together, making them all interoperable, um, really getting to that long-term goal of seamless financial services. That's great. So one last topic that I want to visit for today is NFTs. So as some people might know, I have been, uh, I haven't been a big fan of NFTs <laughs> in the past. Yep. Um, and one of the things that really got me excited about NFTs for the first time is your collaboration with Lightman. Can you tell Thanks. us a bit about that? Yeah, that has been a really fun project over the last few months. It came about because there was so much out there about NFTs and we kind of dialed in on the concept of just using it as a vehicle for our customers to earn income because often they have skills, but if you're a refugee and you get placed in a refugee camp, it's even if you have the legal right to work, it's very difficult to get a job. And so they often end up sitting around, they have time, they have skills, and a lot of them actually have phones. And so we said, okay, what, what would happen if we just threw some NFTs out there? And facilitated getting their work to a global buyer's market. And it has been awesome to see the support from the Stellar community and the broader community. Basically what we do is we solicit the pieces from the artists who are mostly refugees in Rwanda. Um, and then we list those on Lightment and anyone can buy them, please go buy them. And, <laughs> and then the money gets funneled back into the individual's leaf wallet. I've been excited about it because I haven't seen much in the space of impact art. Uh, that's what I'm calling it. We see it in the traditional art world, but everything in the NFT space has been more like proceeds from this will go to an organization, not money directly going from a buyer to a, a creator or a, or a seller or whatever you want to call them. And so that's been, that's been really fun to collaborate with Lightman on. Also, I, I have to mention JPEG DAO because we did a cool project with them where they financed phones for some artists, traditional artists who didn't have smartphones. So we actually did smartphone training. What is an email address? What is a username? What is an app? How do you buy data for a smartphone? And then they've been able to create pieces and, and earn income just as well as anybody else. Great. And that's like equitable access at its finest. And, you know, so many people in the blockchain ecosystem are like, uh, you know, talking the talk about equitable access, but I think you folks are really doing it. So oh, that's thank awesome. you. Appreciate it. Okay. Uh, anything uh, for closing? Would you uh, like to give some uh, information about what you're going to do next uh, at the app? Get people sure. at home excited? Yeah. Well, we're, we are very excited for smart contracts coming because we have been piloting a lending product. So we know that people don't just need a digital wallet. Storing and transporting your money across borders is great, but you need to do other things. And if you're already on LEAF, you should be able to do them there. So we've started a microloans program, really excited to move that logic into smart contracts at some point in the future. We're also trying to address the identity space because we know that getting access to products and services is incredibly difficult if you can't prove that you are who you say you are. So we're working on a light version of the wallet. And also you mentioned DIDs yesterday, working on a decentralized identity solution for people to verify their identity and prove it to third parties even outside of LEAF. Okay. And I just want to make it very clear that we did not coordinate. I did not nope, ask you nothing. to plug in smart contracts. <laughs> Obviously, I'm also excited about that. 
It was really great having you today, Tori. And yeah, thanks, I'm looking Summer. forward to seeing what you do next. Great.